Hi. Did you all know we're in the middle of a global pandemic? We wanted to lighten the mood a little bit, so we decided to ask our presenters a few questions about what they've been up to over the last two years while they've been stuck at home. So for Emily, we wanted to know what her quarantine hobby was. She said she wanted to have one indoor hobby and one outdoor hobby. So she went to the store and bought a bunch of embroidery stuff to learn how to embroider, embroider which she hasn't touched, and rollerblades, which she's too afraid to use. <laughs> know your limits, Emily. <laughs> And with that, please welcome Emily to the stage. Talk. Uh, so thanks, Lauren. I'm ready to go. So who here has watched Squid Games on Netflix? A good number, okay, but not a lot. Interesting, interesting. It's a really cool series on Netflix, a South Korean TV show. Um, don't worry, I won't give any spoilers if you do want to go watch this afterwards. And it's essentially um, hundreds of people who are really in debt. Um, decide to play or are invited to play a series of six children's games. Um, and it's, the games are designed to give everyone a chance without discrimination. And if you win, you win tons of money and all your problems are solved. So I'll describe the games quickly. You might have heard of some of these. The first is red light, green light, where the leader is facing the wall and everyone runs towards them. They run, but when they yell green light and when you turn around and yell red light, everyone has to stop exactly where they are and if you move, you're out. The second game was called PUBG, where you're given a honeycomb wafer, it's very thin, and a needle, and you have a certain amount of time to separate the stamped shape from the rest of the honeycomb. And if you break the shape, or if you don't do it in time, you're out. Next, we play tug of war, two teams pulling on opposite ends of a rope, trying to get the other team across the line in order to win. And then we move into marbles, which is a little bit different. Everybody gets 10 marbles, and you're in pairs, and whoever gets all 20 marbles between the two of you wins. You don't really have to, you can figure out how you want to play that game, just the winner is the one that gets all the marbles. The fifth game is where things get a little crazy. Um, it's the glass bridge. So you have two parallel bridges. Um, some of the panels are tempered and therefore strong and would hold your weight. The other ones are just regular glass and you would fall through. And then finally, if you manage to make it through all of these challenges, you play the squid game. And this one is a little bit uh, more difficult to explain, but it's kind of like an offense defense where you have to protect your own area from invasion from the other people playing. And so, um, yeah, once you get all the way through those games, um, you're the winner, and you win wild amounts of money, your life has changed, everything is amazing, you're doing great stuff, in theory. And now you're probably wondering, why on earth am I here talking about Squid Games at AGU Ignite? Um, and that's because, true story, actual thought I was having when I was watching Squid Games was, am I in a real life Squid Games? As a woman in STEM, Am I living in a real life Squid Games? And here's why. Here's, there's many similarities, but I'll highlight just a few. Just like in Squid Games, women are weeded out of STEM very quickly. In fact, only 23% of women who earn STEM degrees stay in STEM careers. That's a pretty big rate. Um, the next one is you can't get distracted. If you get distracted in Squid Games, you've lost, you're out. Same with women. If you have a baby or you want to, or even you're potentially going to have a baby, you're discriminated against and there are very few or fewer opportunities for you. And in fact, fathers are rewarded for having babies. Um, second, or third one, excuse me, structural and unnatural competition. So among equal work, um, usually men's work, if it's an equal contribution, men's work is rated higher than women's work. And we're, even though it's exactly the same thing if it's associated with a man versus a woman. Next thing, undervalued contributions. So women are often done the invisible work and we ask to do, we ask to do all of the diversity work so all of our programs can check that diversity box. So we're doing all of this extra work for less money that doesn't get us promoted at all. So that's always fun. And then, the last one, is faceless men seem to have made all of these rules for no other reason that I can see except for that's the way it's always been done, which is literally the worst explanation for anything I've ever heard. So all of these things are cumulative and they are cascading and they're weeding women out of STEM at, at basically the same rates as it's been for decades. 
And again, just like Squid Games, a lot of us in this room, maybe before this talk, might have thought that STEM is designed to give everyone an equal chance without discrimination. But the reality is, that is absolutely not true, and it never has been. So, do you want to change it? I hope so. <laughs> so I'm here, hopefully, to inspire you all to start to try to take actions with some of these things. We know how to change some of these things, and it's been decades, and we still haven't made any progress. So ask yourself if you have done something to improve your institutions and your departments, and if you haven't, then is there something that you can do um, in the future to change that? So thank you. So next up, I am very excited to welcome Tamara Aranez, a PhD student at the University of Washington and a Chilean Fulbright Scholar. So Tamara says that one of her favorite COVID activities was multitasking. Classic activities like kneading dough while in a meeting or working out while Zoom watching colloquium. And now I'm really wondering what the rest of you are up to while your cameras are off on Teams. <laughs> so she will be presenting the Remote Analysis War, GPS versus Geomorphology in the Atacama Desert. Everyone, please welcome Tamara. Yeah. So have you heard about the American dream? Yeah. Of course you have. I have too. And I came to the US in September 2020, middle of a pandemic, to pursue my PhD in earth sciences. I have a backpack full of desire of doing research and contributing to scientific knowledge. And I chose the University of Washington in Seattle because that was my place. I really wanted to run under the rain, drink coffee, and that was my American dream. However, after a couple of weeks meeting my community, I realized that I was the only international student in my cohort. I was part of an underrepresented group of people of color, and we were only two Latinx in all the department. So I started to look if this was a local issue or it was a, lo a global problem. And according to Nature Geoscience, people who is publishing is not people from my region. We're not even considered as reviewers. So, this lack of diversity and feeling dry in academia inspired me to choose a place that is also really dry, the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. The has crustal faults that are really complex and caught my attention. So excited to study this place, I had to decide how I was going to study. Remember that borders were closed and I had no funding to do field work, so it needed to be something that I can do from my desk. And that's when the remote analysis came to my mind, and geodesy and geomorphology appeared here and started the remote analysis work. So I had a mission, and my mission was finding the sleep rate of these faults, because no one knows how fast these faults are moving, and that's essential to understand the neotectonics and assess any seismic hazard. The first part of the mission was carried by geodesy bringing new hopes. 39 sites, 39 GPS sites, and one of them was just next to my fault, the, the fault that I was studying, not my fault, but three earthquakes were recording the information, um, the recording data in these sites, and I had this model that I knew that, let's imagine that this ball is the GPS site. I had some cookies that were filling the, the, the ball, with, and I was going to compare these cookies that were coming from the earthquake with the observation of my GPS site. So, if I subtract my model from my observations and I still find a cookie in my bowl, I was going to say, well, this cookie is the solar grande fault and I can find the sleep rate of the fault. Great, right? But, obviously, reality is way more different. And the, the model that I was using was not straightforward. The coverage of the GPS was not great because the sites were far. I was kind of depressed and then happy, but then I remembered that I had this other powerful tool, and then geomorphology counterattacked with the long-term analysis, because these fall were active for two million years, so the topography was recording all this deformation. I identified 67 deflected channels along the fault, 
And a previous study uh, has a cosmogenic age. And with this average and cosmogenic age, I will find a sleep rate and complete my mission. After fighting with numbers and errors and uncertainties, I found two different values with an order of magnitude different. So 0 0.11 from geomorphology and 30.7 millimeters per year from geodesy. Yeah. Tired, confused, I went to talk to my mentor and I realized that the value that I was finding wasn't an absolute value, it was a range where geomorphology is underestimating the sleep rate and geodesy was taking a package of faults, giving me a maximum. So geomorphology and geodesy are working together and they're powerful tools if you don't have access to geographical areas or if you have limitations like physical limitations or financial limitations. And this is just a battle in my PhD. I really hope that geomorphology and geodesy work together as allies against an enemy that we don't see but is there. And I'm not talking about active tectonics because I like my cross deform. I'm talking about the lack of diversity, the imperialism, the, the colonialism in geosciences that haven't had changes in the last decades. So my call is if you want to fight and combat in this war, Start collaborating with your scientists from non-wealthy countries. Bring a student from different nations, from different backgrounds, from different colors. Because diversity in students today is diversity in academy tomorrow. And as the Atacama Desert can flourish, I know that your scientists can flourish too. Thank you. Next up, we have Keith Gaddis, the program manager for the NASA Biological Diversity and Ecological Forecasting Programs. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever thought your camera was off in a meeting when it actually was on? All right. <laughs> well, Keith once Googled someone in a meeting who had said a mean comment to a colleague, but he forgot that he was displaying his screen to everyone at the time. <laughs> that someone asked Keith, why are you Googling me? <laughs> So that should make some of you feel a little bit better while you're messily eating your lunch and you thought no one was watching. Uh, with that, please welcome Keith with his talk, Ask First. So like many of you, I work for NASA Earth Science Division's uh, Applied Sciences Program, which aims to take NASA's Earth observing capability and put it in the hands of decision makers, which seems obviously beneficial, but in practice is exceptionally hard. There are any number of ways in which we can stumble along that, that process between building initial sort of capability and transitioning that into a platform that decision makers can use. But I would argue that the reason that we fail in this process more often than not traces back to decisions made at the beginning of the process. Because we assume. We assume what the end users need we assume what their problems are. We assume why they've failed in their efforts in the past. We assume how we can best help them. And we assume that they actually want our help. And so in essence, we fail to ask first. And that leads to uh, missteps along the way and leads to failures that I've seen more times than not. So what I wanted to do today is present an analogy to you that demonstrates why these efforts fail when we don't start by asking. So imagine you're home one day, it's a Sunday afternoon, you're enjoying some much needed relaxation time, and you have a perfect array of garbage food and garbage TV to enjoy, right? And you're sitting on the couch, falling asleep when you hear a knock at the door. You initially assume it's the Amazon package of Funyuns that you ordered last week, but the knock comes this time even louder. So you get up, you spill your coffee along the way, and you go to the door to find a person standing before you that you've never seen before. He's very professionally dressed, he looks very determined, and he tells you he's there to help you with your grocery shopping habits. And in fact, he's done a very significant analysis to help you based on the last few months of digging through your trash. In fact, he has all of his trash, trash records, and he's brought it together in this model and can show that by looking at these records across time, you could save 20% on your annual monthly grocery shopping bill. What more, he's actually brought this together into an online package that tracks those grocery shopping habits across time and will be regularly updated based on future dumpster diving efforts. 
What more, he's noticed that you gained weight, and he thinks that actually you eat way, far too much high-calorie foods, and he actually currently has a proposal into NSF to hire two postdocs to help you with this effort and add in that capability to inform how you uh, track and can potentially use your grocery shopping habit to lose weight. Now, it's obvious you're going to be upset by this, right? You're probably going to threaten to call the authorities. You're probably going to uh, tell him that you had no intention to change your grocery shopping habits and you never would come to him for the advice. And, you know, before you can even get to him calling you fat and getting money from the federal government to address it, you hear a voice behind him and it's another person approaches. And as she comes closer and closer, she says, this man is a fraud. His analysis is rife with errors. And what more? He failed to look at any recycling data. I have been going not only through your trash, but also your recycling for the last few months. And my analysis, using proper, proper statistical analysis, shows that you could actually save 30% on your annual monthly grocery bills. Now, it's obvious to see in this comical, hyperbolic analysis, or uh, example, uh, how you know, people with the best of intentions are actually causing more harm than good. But I would argue that scientists do this all the time. For instance, take an example scientist who sees a rising drought occurring within the Midwest that leads to crop failure. And they look at this problem and they say, you know, I want to do something about that. So they gather together the best satellite data, the best in situ records. They build this model that shows how you could do water allocation strategies in the area to minimize crop losses. And after years of effort, they take this, uh, this information and present it to a bewildered group of, of farmers who have long since transitioned to drought resilient crops and actually make more money now than they ever did before the drought began. And this, this is not just lost time. These individuals probably have no idea that NASA has, that the government is funding satellites in orbit that can track their behaviors across time. So they're likely to be hostile, if not just incredulous, about the efforts. You see, people are like teenagers. They don't like people messing with their stuff across time and then giving unsolicited advice. And so if you want to implement change, you have to build a relationship. You have to listen. You have to ask. And you only give advice when it's solicited for, when they actually ask you for it. Now, I recognize this is incredibly difficult, right? Um, and scientists may not either have the, the, the knowledge set, the training, or even the resources to be successful in this process. But if we actually want our science to be more than cocktail party anecdotes, it behooves us to make that possible. So we need to normalize asking first. Build the tools, the trainings, and the people who can carry these activities forward. And I think doing so will increase the effect that Earth observations have on benefiting the lives and livelihoods of people across the planet. Thanks. Thank you so much for that incredible talk, Keith, and for sharing that very important message with us all through the science community. But I don't think I would actually mind if those cute scientists interrupted my reality TV binge watching. So next up, I am happy to introduce our final speaker before the intermission, Ned Baer, an associate researcher at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So the record for solving a Rubik's Cube is 3.47 seconds. Do you guys know who set that time? It wasn't Ned, <laughs> definitely not. But he did take up Rubik's Cube during the pandemic, so maybe we'll see his name in the record book someday. For now though, he can share his knowledge on the backcountry explosion across the United States with us. Everyone, please welcome Ned to the stage. Thanks for that introduction. You, you all look much better without little boxes around your head on Zoom. Um, so, you know, from an early age, I loved uh, shoveling snow and, and having that solitary experiences. And in fact, I uh, got so good at it um, that I uh, wound up moving to California and, uh, you know, saw a lot more snow, also a lot more people, um, although there were these solitary experiences I could enjoy. Um, at the time when I was working as a ski patroller, this was the largest avalanche I had ever seen. This actually turns out to happen about every 10 years or so in Mammoth uh, Mountain. Um, I met a friend there uh, who showed me the importance of wilderness, right, and why you might want to be alone out there. Um, you know, these are uh, special experiences, and we all enjoy them in our own ways. Um, you know, uh, so... 
my kids here, um, I want to uh, leave this uh, world uh, as, as good or better as I found it um, and let them enjoy the same experiences. In the words of uh, Bill Maher, the earth is a timeshare, right? And, and so this is, these, these experiences are very important, I think, to all of us. This is Colorado for, a Colorado 14er. Um, half a million people summited Colorado 14ers last year, okay? We had um, uh, this is a Sierra Trading Post commercial, actually. We, we have uh, tremendous usage uh, and, and about 50 people on the summit. This is Lake Tahoe, okay, in the wintertime. If you've been there, the parking situation is a mess, okay? We've, since 2007, we've had 70% um, usage increases in the trail systems in Lake Tahoe. This is, I, I guided on Mount Hood here uh, above this um, Bergshund, this uh, hole, this crack, um, and uh, this was a helicopter crash uh, during a rescue. This is actually a common sight on Mount Hood. You know, these, these areas, uh, the, these high points are packed nowadays, and none of us want to see that. This is Yosemite, the cable route on Half Dome, which is now um, a permitted um, climb to go on. Yosemite, 60,000 uh, visitors uh, about 100 years ago, over five, almost 5 million in 2019. Winter backcountry usage has seen especially large increases. 3x increase in gear sales, for example, from REI. Um, record number of avalanche fatalities last year. This was an unfortunate event outside of Salt Lake City where um, seven skiers were trapped in an avalanche and they avalanched the group below them in a skin track. Four people were killed, okay? These are tragic events and, and looking at trail counter data, from that day, we had 1,508 people in these canyons to the east of Salt Lake City. So that's enough for people to literally be skiing on top of each other, and it, it's sad. Is this, is this a tragedy of the commons? Is this, is this all bad? Well, the gear's gotten a lot better. I'd be interested to talk to anyone afterwards if they've, they've recognized the Raymer ski bindings on the right. This is Lou Dawson's collection from Wild Snow. Maybe the only thing you can do with these, these touring bindings now is mount them on the wall as they've evolved. One thing that Silverton, Colorado did to combat this is they opened up uh, traffic only to locals. They closed down their uh, national forest included access, which is maybe illegal. That's one way to deal with it, right? But not a very realistic one, probably illegal. And uh, here's a, um, a permit system, two bucks uh, if you have a pass to Yosemite. Um, requires a little bit of planning, but in my opinion has, has greatly improved the experience for everyone there. This is from Wasatch Backcountry Alliance. They want to put LTE modems on trail counters so that you can see traffic in real time, um, just like you would see you know, your Google traffic layer, and I think a great way to maybe adjust behaviors so everyone has a better experiences, experience. Uh, this is the shuttle system in Zion National Park, um, really a fabulous shuttle system, I think the best in the park system. Um, you know, like any park, they, they had overcrowding on the roads and, and needed to implement this shuttle system. This is an app for, um, that we have in um, Mammoth Lakes, where I live. It shows you where you're camped, where you are. The land ownership's complicated. A lot of people disperse camp in um, areas where they, they don't know whether camping is allowed, and we need apps like this to, to show them. This is uh, a $500 million proposed gondola up Little Cottonwood Canyon. I don't know if you've ever been there in the winter, but it gets very crowded, has avalanche problems and all sorts of traffic jams. Um, it'll be interested to interesting to see if the voters of uh, Salt Lake approve this. Um, one thing we can do is to stop rapaciously marketing our public lands, as one Wasatch Backcountry Alliance um, person told me. Uh, this is a video from our tourism office in Mammoth Lakes that uh, is a little bit dishonest. And um, this finally is a video to adjust expectations that the Park Service um, shows us from Glacier National Park. So, you know, in, in summary, I, I don't have the answers, and um, I think there are a lot of smart people here, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about all of this. Thank you. I had to. Thank you. All right. So with that, let's jump right back in. I am thrilled to announce Dahlia Kirschbaum, the... All right. She is the chief of the Hydrological Sciences Laboratory at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, 
And we asked Dahlia to tell us about a virtual slip up she's had. So unlike Keith, Dahlia knew what was going on on her screen, but she did not know who was on her call. One day, Dahlia was interviewing the former NASA administrator virtually for an Earth Day event and asked the producer how her hair was looking. Well, the administrator answered instead. <laughs> Dahlia, I can tell your hair is looking beautiful today. So we are very excited to hear you speak about harnessing the power of satellite data for disaster response. Everyone, please welcome Dahlia. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is such a fun venue. All right, so on April 25th, uh, 2015, I got a call from our colleagues that a magnitude 7.8 earthquake had hit Nepal. Now at the time, I was in my backyard having a birthday party for my daughter. We had a bounce house, we had butterfly cupcakes. And so after we were done, we stopped and we started to get calls from colleagues all around the world. And the question was what was happening and what could we do? We were hearing about damage in Kathmandu, and we were hearing about landslides in, our, in other areas. We even heard about the fact that a major landslide in the Lang Tang Valley demolished a town of 200 people. And so as we started to hear from our colleagues, the big question is, what can we do to help from our offices? And so we harnessed the power of satellite data to talk to people on the ground and we said, what can we do? And they said, we're worried about landslides blocking rivers because they could cause catastrophic outbreaches downslope. We said, okay. So we took landslide, we took satellite data and we started mapping landslides. Teams from all over the world used high resolution imagery to start to look at where landslides were on the landscape and when the aftershock started occurring, we continued to update that and inform people on the ground. So not only were we helping emergency responders to identify these geomorphic hazards, but we also were able to look at the processes and actually did a science paper that helped us to look at 3,000 landslides and understand the connection between emergency response and the scientific processes. So going around the world to another location, Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico, 2017. Satellite data was critical in helping us understand the impact of this storm immediately. From the high winds, to the flooding, to the rainfall accumulations, you know, the, the radar on the ground in Puerto Rico was blown, blown away. And so we need to understand with satellite data how much rain was actually falling. How were areas, this is a Landsat image from before the event, how were these areas affected? And so by being able to see before and then during this event, after the event, we could see where there was flooding. We could see where the rivers were swollen with sediment and what was spilling in to, to the Caribbean Sea and, and helping impact fisheries as well as emergency response inland. Now, taking it a little bit closer to home, we can also understand landslides. We can look at how the impact of, how, of where the slopes are occurring, where we have extreme rainfall. We started to map landslides there too, trying to understand the impacts to roads, to infrastructure, and really get, um, harness that power. So going, again, to our own backyard, this is Hurricane Ida. It occurred this year, three months ago, where we're standing. Now this is a view from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, which can look at the intensity of this storm. This storm rapidly intensified in 24 hours from a Cat 1 to a Cat 4. And the heavy rainfall made it the second, and the, and the winds made it the second strongest event ever to hit Louisiana and caused $95 billion in damage. Right? This was just three months ago. Now, understanding where the rainfall accumulated was really helpful for emergency responders to start to look at where we may have impacts. Everything from the Mississippi Delta, where leaves and debris were removed and really impacted the ecosystems of the region, as well as where flooding was inundating towns. And another thing that we can do is we can start to take this information and put it in models. This is soil moisture. And as the storm made landfall, we worked with our disasters team and the Coast Guard and others to start to understand how these types of processes may impact response all the way up the eastern seaboard. Now, one of the most powerful things we can also do is we can see the human imprint, the impacts of this. This is New Orleans before Hurricane Ida hit. And then what you'll see is a view of after. And so what we can understand is the fact that there's pretty much complete devastation in the city of New Orleans 
where we're standing. 30,000 telephone poles were removed in Louisiana because of high winds. Now we know that the fact that these types of events are becoming more frequent, they are becoming more, more extreme, and we see that from space, but we know how personal it is, how power outages from space, this is what they look like on the ground. And so with the disasters team, with our colleagues in science and in applications, asking the right questions, we're helping to inform the full disaster life cycle, not just in response, but from mitigation all the way through to building resilience, working together with communities, and ultimately to prepare and protect so we can mitigate against these events. Now, why are we at NASA doing this? Well, we have tools that can see places that I've never been, like Nepal. I work there all the time, and I've never set foot in the country. But with tools like this, we can look at how surface winds with slopes, with precipitation, and soil moisture can all be used to better understand and mitigate these events. So we can start to inspire people like me when I was little, to me when I was bigger, and really, really motivate others to understand the power of this to really impact our future. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific presentation, Dahlia. Thank you so much. I'm sure that's a question that's been on a lot of our minds, and we appreciate you giving us something to start to think about. Um, next up, we have Baker Perry, who is a professor at Appalachian State University and a National Geographic Explorer, who will be presenting on high elevation weather stations, rationale, challenges, and new insights. But first, do you all remember that time when all of the stores during COVID ran out of toilet paper? <laughs> well, Baker said that if he had to panic by one thing, if we went into lockdown again, it would not be toilet paper but it would be a flock of hens. Now that is resourceful thinking, Baker. <laughs> so with that, please welcome Baker to the stage. As a child, I lived in the Bolivian Andes, and I know you can't tell who I am in this photo on the upper left, but I came to appreciate the importance of the meltwater runoff from the snow and ice there on the uh, higher peaks that sustain the cities of La Paz and El Alto. These high mountain regions are changing, and they are warming faster than the global average. They're also, we're seeing more heavy precipitation, rising snow levels, and more drought. And so these water towers are vulnerable, and it's clear that they're in trouble as the mountain snow and ice vanishes. But we don't have enough observations, in situ observations from weather stations in these locations. In fact, there are only 19 weather stations that we know of between about five and 6,000 meters, and only six above 6,000 meters globally. So we don't fully understand the scientific processes that are critically important. And we need to expand these observational networks. I installed my first station in a peat bog in Peru at over 5,000 meters on the land of Don Pedro Garofredo, one of the highest permanent inhabitants in the world at this elevation. And we installed another station on the nearby Oshoyo Ananta ice cap, but after triggering a small avalanche and watching the crevasse hazard grow as we serviced the station, we elected to take it down and move it to the nearby Kelkaya ice cap, where we installed high quality precipitation sensors that have shown overwhelmingly that the moisture comes from the Amazon basin, that heavy precipitation occurs at night, and net accumulation is not a good proxy for precipitation. Earlier this year, National Geographic and Rolex mounted an expedition to Tupungato Volcano in Chile, where the six million inhabitants of Santiago directly depend on this vulnerable water tower. My colleague Gino Casasa and his team had installed two stations previously in 2020 on neighboring Tupungatito Volcano, and our mission was to install a higher station on Tupungato. We faced a number of major challenges, including a blizzard that pinned us in our tents. And of course, it was COVID pandemic, and we had so many COVID tests that were agonizing. I think they sampled some of my brain matter in some of those, actually. But the weather broke, and we had success in installing the highest weather station in the Americas that has indicated how steep the lapse rates are with temperature and also the importance of sublimation. 
in 2019, National Geographic and Rolex also mounted an expedition to Mount Everest. And we spent nearly two, two months in the vicinity of base camp and installed a network of weather stations including one in the Sherpa community of Fort Say, one on a medial moraine just above base camp, one on the lower Kumbu Glacier, one at Camp 2, and another at the South Call, and the highest at the balcony at over 8,000 meters. All of these installations were true team efforts. My colleague Tom Matthews and our Sherpa team members playing critical roles in the installation of this one that you see on the lower Kumbu Glacier. The expedition became very intense as we entered the Kumbu Icefall and negotiated seracs that were massive and crevasses that were bottomless. But we eventually emerged into the Western Kum and installed a weather station at Camp 2. Then we climbed the Lotse face and installed a station at the South Call, where we've already measured wind speeds of nearly 150 miles an hour. This is before sensor failure. And some of the most intense sunshine in the world that together results in substantial ablation. And then we moved to the balcony, where we overcame extreme cold, frozen oxygen masks and cold batteries to install the highest weather station in the world at the balcony. We continue to work very closely with our Sherpa team members to operate and maintain, maintain these stations and want to extend the climate record as long as possible. But we need more stations and networks from other locations around the world, especially in the Hindu Kush Karakoram the headwaters of the mighty Indus river basin that sustains hundreds of millions of people downstream. And so I invite you all to join us in analyzing these data sets and also expanding the observational networks further so that we can improve our understanding of future climate change and water resource availability in these locations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baker, for that awesome presentation. And at the very least, it looks like you are well prepared with winter clothes for AGU in Chicago next year. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is Jen Schmidt, an assistant professor of natural resource management and policy at the University of Alaska, Anchorage. We asked Jen, what was a surprising silver lining of the pandemic for you? And Jen told us she actually enjoys wearing masks because it hides her distaste for people, places, and things. <laughs> so I actually want to do another show of hands here. How many of you agree with that? <laughs> Jen, I think you're really onto something. <laughs> Tonight, Jennifer's presentation is Few and Far Between, Food, Energy, and Water in Rural Alaska. Everyone, please welcome Jen to the stage. Okay, so um, food, energy, and water in Alaska is complex. In this picture here, you can see a person pulling a walrus back to the village. The walrus tusks are sticking up there, and you have water, you're in the ocean, and you have the gas can. And so Alaska is a huge place. There are over 200 communities that are off the road system. The only way to get there is flying by barge or by river. And you can see a village up on the north slope and a village down in southeast, so rainforest all the way to the Arctic Ocean. And so we wanted to develop this framework so that we could look at um, food, water, and energy security and identify issues, drivers, and solutions. So availability, access, quality, and preference are the things that we're looking at for food, water, energy security. And so first, availability. This is a store shelf in rural Alaska. You will go into the store and sometimes you will find that nothing is available. It's very remote, difficult to get things in, and especially produce, things that are perishable. Availability, not all the communities have piped water. This is an example of a community that does not, and you can see the 55-gallon drums there. People will take them out to the rivers, the lakes, get their own water, and set up their hand washing station there. This is an example of a store. A person turned their house into a store. 
The availability, well, if you want to bake a cake, you're set. Or snack on some junk food, you're, you're good. But there's not fresh milk there or fresh produce there. Rural Alaska is expensive. <laughs> I couldn't afford to live in rural Alaska. $70 for diapers, $25 for a can of coffee, and if you like pop, which is heavy to fly into rural Alaska, $15 for a 12, 12 pack of pop. Uh, as far as access goes with energy, a lot of um, gr these are micro-gridded communities, and they're often powered by diesel engines. When that diesel engine goes down, then you know, residents don't have power. This person, they couldn't do their laundry. Also, there's typically one water treatment plant. Million dollar plants go into the communities. And sometimes maintenance doesn't happen. Things go wrong. In this place, their water treatment plant burned to the ground and they didn't have water for six weeks. Um, yeah, I went to this community and walked into the bathtub and this was the water that came out to fill their tub. Personally, I passed on taking a bath in this person's house. I would not take, uh, be very happy with that quality of water. And getting again to food, pictures of some heads of lettuce there uh, from one of the stores in rural Alaska. Climate change is having a, an effect on this in that icing events cause the plains to not be able to get in to rural Alaska, especially like southwest Alaska, and things come in rotten. If you're looking to go to the gas station, here's your gas station in rural Alaska. Many of the places get fuel delivery one time a year. And if there's water in that fuel, you have to deal with the low quality fuel for, the, for a year. As far as preference goes, I would rather eat subsistence foods than the, the, the carrots that I showed you. Here's an example of someone ha harvesting a halibut. You have braided seal intestine and a reindeer out in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, subsistence foods are very important for social and cultural events. Here is a native potlatch where people are singing and dancing, and often subsistence foods go with that. Uh, salmon from the Yukon River was, uh, in this community, their primary subsistence foods. So some of the drivers outside of food, energy, and water is transportation. That truck is headed to the local store with uh, all the food and drinks for the village. It came off of that plane. That brings in fuel one time a year. Sharing and health are also very important. Um, here an elder is working with a, a young person to skin a walrus. Uh, health is also tied into if you don't eat healthy foods, you're not going to be healthy. So it's kind of circular. Policies, um, very important, bypass mail. Oh, so much uh, Amazon goes into rural Alaska. That this is boxes that came in off of a plane, bypass mail, important. Subsidies, energy prices are really, really high. So there, there are subsidies to help people pay for that. But we get to work with communities and come up with solutions and opportunities. So solar panels on a water treatment plant to reduce the energy costs to provide water, or solar and wind on a house to help reduce their energy costs. Here's an example of greenhouses. Since the fruit and vegetables were so bad, why not grow your own vegetables within the community and use biomass, solar, or wind to help grow food and increase your food security? Some other things, too, are wind. Here's an example of a community where they have windmills, and they use the excess energy from those windmills to turn off their diesel generators and to heat people's houses. So that wind provides heat, and so you have more money to, say, buy subsistence foods, go out and get fuel, and haul in walruses. Thank you so much for that powerful imagery, Jen. I will say, if Tide cost that much where I live, I would not have been able to afford all those drinks on Bourbon Street last night. <laughs> Finally, we are thrilled to introduce Kent Ross, who you can call Kent, but for us it kind of feels like calling our parents by their first name. Um, <laughs> the chief scientist for something near and dear to our hearts, the NASA DEVELOP program. Um, so a quick show of hands, who here is with the NASA DEVELOP program or has been with the NASA DEVELOP program? Woo! We've got some good representation in the crowd. So for Dr. Ross, his silver lining of the pandemic was spending more time with his family, even his college-aged kids. <laughs> so tonight, Dr. Ross will be closing out our talks by speaking on finding community in earth science applications. Dr. Ross, take it away. Here's the question. Can a group of earth scientists that want to benefit society be a community? 
The group of scientists I'm thinking about is the NASA Earth Science Division's Applied Science Program. But you can extend this to scientists in ESIP and AGU as well. I'm a big fan of Wendell Berry. He's a writer, philosopher, and farmer who is so into community that he returned to his home in Kentucky uh, rather than stay in New York where he'd made a name for himself as an academic and a writer. To explore the characteristics that bring individuals together in community, let's consider a case study based on my family's chickens. We have a flock of a little over two dozen birds of two breeds, Bielefelders and cream leg bars, which you can see here. So the Bielefelders are the big ones. <laughs> One characteristic of our little community is that they have common purpose. They love to forage. This happens as a group. Some push the boundaries, some keep their eye on everybody else to make sure they're staying within those boundaries. Good finds are celebrated. But there are some risks. Our property is part of an area known as Eagle Tree Farm. Here's a bald eagle too close to our coop. He didn't care if we barked or yelled, depending on which species you were. He just stayed there. And there are other predators, so we chicken sit when our flock is out. But some of our flock is also very protective. This is Ted. He keeps an eye on everybody, including us. He's a pretty good sort, but he can be kind of bossy, and he crows like a dinosaur. <laughs> this is Phyllis. Phyllis is our best cream leg bar. She's an omega. She's smaller than all those Bielefelder hens, but she's one of our best and most consistent layers. She's close to the standard of perfection for leg bars, but she's also very grumpy. We remember those in our community who have come and gone. This is Bernina. We nursed her through a tough bout of fowl pox, and through all her up and downs, Bernina was still the alpha hen of the whole group, and she ran a tight ship. She bounced back initially, but we eventually lost her. Our flock loves to get together for a feast. Their favorites are leftover oatmeal and wilted salad packs. Here, Bill is pointing out some good bits from the mixed greens and the Bielefelder hens and the leg bars are all getting together even though they're a little cliquish. So our chickens have many of the traits of a community. But can our earth science friends be part of a community? Uh, here's uh, John Bolton for a shout out. He's another earth scientist that also keeps chickens and we'll get to that answer in a minute. So let's go back to Wendell Berry for a more detailed definition of community. He says, a community is a mental is the mental and spiritual condition of knowing that the place is shared and that the people who share the place define and limit the possibilities of each other's lives. It is the knowledge that people have of each other, their concern for each other, their trust in each other, the freedom with which they come and go among themselves. So here's the problem. Our scientists don't share a place. What can we do about that? Well, even when they don't share a place, if they only share a screen, they often share a moment, a smile, even laughter, a chance to be seen. And though it's infrequent, we do sometimes get together. We come together in physical places to get things done. We have retreats, etc. cetera. Um, and this solidifies our bonds of common purpose. It intensifies our sense of membership. And sometimes, like tonight, we come together in real places to enjoy our friendship, just to share a drink and a laugh, a moment of our distributed lives coming together. Ultimately, we do this because as we seek a community of purpose, and like Doctor Who, we have a duty of care. In the end, though Wendell sees community as rooted in place, I say my community of earth scientists does have a place. And it's crucial that we take care of that place. Distributed or not, we are a community of purpose. We must be a community because our community is needed. Because we are distributed, that community takes a lot more work. But I call on you to join me in that work. I say to you all, be my neighbor.